now. Our first guest is going to be a one-on-one -on -one chat, a one-on-two, because I'll have the symposium editor for the Morat Sports Journal up here with me, who has a relation to our special guest. The first LGBTQ2 plus NFL player is with us today. He's from Westchester. We'll sit down and talk to him. Just finished a season with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Carl Nassib, we'll talk, Carl Nassib, we'll talk to Carl right now. Right here. Up here with me, I want you to say hello to Grace Polisano. Grace is our symposium editor. Grace has organized this great day for us. So a lot of what you see here today was organized by Grace. And Grace, I'm going to let you start and explain how you know this guy. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so like Professor Brandt said, I am the symposium editor here for the Sports Law Journal. Um, and Carl is my first cousin. So my mom and his mom... I know you want to talk a little bit about this, but be your first cousins and they are sisters. So, yeah. so both of our moms uh, played volleyball here. Um, Grace and I, unfortunately, were not lucky enough to get offers to come play sports at Villanova, but uh, we're not holding that against anybody here. But uh, I'm very, very happy to be here. This is exciting, and I love talking sports. I love talking life and everything in between, and I hope to uh, make this a great experience and to have some fun. This is really great. Absolutely. So to get started... Um, like Professor Brandt said, Carl's from Westchester, Pennsylvania. So, Carl, you grew up in Villanova's backyard. Yep. Um, you attended Malvern Prep. Can you talk a little bit about your experience there and your football experience there um, since you did not start one game at Malvern Prep? Yes. Yes. I know. Yep. So, we both went to Interact Schools. I went to Malvern Prep. Any, any friars in here? No? Not one? Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So, what was interesting about my time at Malvern was I played three different sports. I had the best time but I ended up never starting one single game at Malvern. And I guess that's pretty interesting to never start and then somehow make it to a Power Five conference school. And I did walk on and it was a great experience there as well. But I really had the best support system to get me through kind of a tough ride on the football team. My brother was on the, my brother played football at Malvern. My dad played football at Malvern. Malvern. My younger brother played football there. So we just really enjoyed the, the, the culture and, and, and the tradition. And um, one thing that like I really appreciated was um, the, the community of the Interact and like just the town and like there was something different about it that I really can't explain, but you don't find it everywhere. And even though it wasn't the most successful um, football career, high school football career anybody's had, I didn't finish it really strong. Is there anybody from St. Joe's Prep here? Any prep guys? Nope. Oh my gosh. <laughs> anyway, so my, my, my last game as a college, I mean, as a high school athlete, I had three sacks against St. Joe's Prep, and that was like the only thing that got me into college. So thank you to St. Joe's Prep for uh, making me be here today. Yeah. From that storied career at Malvern, you go to Penn State, and you just mentioned it. Walk on at Penn State to an All-American. Tell us about that. Yeah, I, uh, I, did I uh, played five years at Penn State, and I had three different head coaches, four different defensive coordinators, um, and there was a lot of, a lot of uh, turnover there. But what I did that I think benefited me the most was I surrounded myself with the best people. I surrounded myself I, with the walk-ons. We called them, you know, we called ourselves "Walk on You," and we would hold up the U anytime any of us did anything remotely impressive, a <laughs> remotely impressive at practice. You know what I mean? And looking back, it's a little cringy, but they were they were the most hardworking individuals and most humble people that I could find. And we were doing push-ups in the dorm room, you know, every night. We were just really kind of grinding through that walk-on lifestyle where we were sneaking into dining halls because we couldn't, they, the scholarship kids got it for free. You know, back when NIL wasn't a thing, we were really, really um, pinching pennies. But the number one thing that really, I believe, took me from being a walk-on to achieving all the goals that I really set for myself was surrounding myself with the best and most hardworking people. 
Can you take us a little more into that walk-on culture? You're in there. You're never going to play. Is that right? What did you say? Were you ever going to play? At Penn State? Yeah. I thought so. <laughs> I mean, you got to have some great fortitude to endure that level of practice every day with no guarantees, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I one time told my head coach that I uh, wanted to play in the NFL. It was after my uh, sophomore season. I think I was 19. And I said, hey, coach, I really want to play football in the NFL. And he was an NFL head coach at one time. And he said, let me stop you right there. And I said, okay. And he said, for you to play in the NFL is ludicrous. Get the F out of my office. <laughs> so I was like, okay. So I kept all those goals to myself moving forward. But I never let that kind of stuff get in my way. I never really listened to people. And I've always had this, at some points, um, delusional optimism. So, yeah, I, uh, I always thought that I would play and make it. And uh, like I said before, my dad and my brothers always believed in me, too. And when your inner circle believes in you, the outside noise really doesn't really factor in. Penn State to the pros. How did it happen? So I was, I, uh, I don't know if lucky is the right word, but I was lucky enough to get drafted to the Browns in 2016, and we went 1-31 in my first two years. I don't know if anybody has gone 0-16 in something before. Um, but I've had some real highs and real lows in, in my, uh, I played seven years in the NFL. And playing in Cleveland, I met, made some of the best friends but that was definitely one of the more, more challenging times in my life. When you get branded like a loser, it's really hard to wash that out. And in the NFL, they want people who win. They want people who know success and know what, knows what it, and they know what it feels like. So starting off, when you get drafted, you have no control over who picks you. And so I was lucky enough to get drafted in the third round, but then had to endure two years of being a national embarrassment. So, you know, I fast forward, I played in Tampa for two years, and those were honestly the two best years in, in my NFL career. I had so much fun. My teammates were amazing. I ended up being captain my uh, fourth year in the NFL. And uh, it's just, it's a constant grind, and it's a constant competition every single day. And it's, a, it's almost like a lifestyle. I tell people it's a lifestyle being a, an NFL player. Because even if in the off season you still got to maintain staying in shape, maintain um, your skill. It doesn't. It's not like riding a bike. You got to continue to get better every day. Because these young guys, man, coming out of college every year, they're just faster and stronger. They're coming for your job. So uh, yeah, it, um, it it's been a long, quick seven years. I was just talking to uh, Mr. Tuck back there about how quickly it goes by. But uh, you know, it, it's been a it's been a blessing playing for seven years for sure. Yeah, so talked a lot about your career at Tampa Bay. So we went to a game this year. I went to your game this year against the Saints, and you had a huge game, um, a game-winning sack. So do you want to talk a little bit about the atmosphere in Tampa, but also compared to the atmosphere at Penn State? That was a cool. That was a fun game. That was a that was, was a Monday a night game. game. One of my best friends, who's valedictorian at, at Notre Dame, calls me at 5 p.m. on a Monday. He's like, "Hey, man, what's up?" Like, oh, I have a game right now. So, like, I, I know not too many people were worried about it, but that was an electric game. I hate the Saints, you know what I mean? I hated Sean Payton. He's, I don't know, I think he's in Denver right now, but never liked him. Never, I know Drew. Why? I don't, because um, he beat us up my first two years in Tampa, you know what I mean? Going into that stadium in New Orleans was tough, and he beat us up, but... And he always had 14 packages. I mean, being a defender, going against it, I mean, the, the game plan for him is like you have to know 14 different packages. So never liked Sean Payton. So that was, a, that was an electric game. And that was, awesome. it was awesome because both my sisters were there. Grace was there with her sister, Catherine. And that was like almost the level of Penn State. I don't know if anyone's ever been to a, a Penn State football game or even a Penn State whiteout. But like that is the most electric environment I've ever been in, I've ever played in. And the passion that I guess is maybe stronger in college sports. It's definitely strong at Penn State and in the Big Ten. And I always tell people I've never felt that type of electricity in the NFL compared to in any game, but like compared to Penn State. So, yeah, that was a good question. Um, so let's transition. So one of your most incredible... Can I ask more about Tampa? Sure. I'm going to ask the fanboy question. So the whole the Brady thing... Did you guys know it was the last year? I had no idea. I, uh, what, what are you talking about? 
Last year? Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. I had no idea. Okay. Yep. I was just worried about myself and keeping myself employed. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now we're actually going to transition. So one of our most, one of your most incredible accomplishments um, has been becoming one of the first out gay players um, in the NFL. So how rewarding has it been to represent the community on like such a large stage? So one of the big things that I was nervous about when I was going to come out was I had done all these years of working to become an NFL player, and I was worried that it would be the only thing I would be remembered for. And that like my years as a walk on, going through all those trials and tribulations, making it to the NFL, making it through Cleveland, getting a second contract, I was worried that that would be all I would be remembered for. But almost two years later, it has been the most rewarding blessing ever. I mean, people come up to me all the time, people come up to my dad, my mom, and just say that, you know, a, a couple, people and made their life a little bit easier. They, you know, I was in Chipotle last week and a guy comes up to me and said, hey, I just watched your video before I came out to my mom. I was like, dude, you making me cry in Chipotle right now? So <laughs> it has been like the greatest experience and I feel so lucky um, that so many brave, amazing people in my community have come before me. And for, my, for me to have an opportunity to, you know, carry that torch has, has really turned out to be one of my greatest, you know, accomplishments for sure. You mentioned the video, and I, we all remember it. What was it two years ago? Almost, yeah. Almost two years ago. What, what was the decision behind that forum for your announcement versus any other way, or social media versus a different way? What was behind the video? Um, I wanted people to see my face and hear it from me. I think a lot of people make big announcements on like their notes or something. Right. And I just felt like it would be more powerful and people wouldn't, um, cause I'm wearing a helmet all the time. I don't think people really know what most NFL players look like on a day to day basis. So I wanted to make a video. I wanted to speak, you know, from the heart. I wanted to be quick. People's attention spans are like that nowadays. And I wanted to really not make it a huge deal. Right. I didn't want to make this huge, um, uh, spectacle of it. I wanted it to, to be just a matter of fact. I wanted it to be normalized. And the reaction that I got from it was 10 out of 10, so supportive. I, feel, I tell people all the time, I feel like I've had more love and support poured into me than anybody that's ever lived. Like it's been, it's been amazing. So um, I'm very happy I did it the way that I did at the timing. And uh, yeah. So. And in the video, you talked about um, your partnership with the Trevor Project, and you know you've been partnered with the Trevor Project since then. So, can you talk a little bit about who the Trevor Project is, what they do, and why you chose them? Yes, absolutely. So, again, I, I wanted to not make it a big deal. I didn't want to make it about me, and I knew that it would get, it would garner a lot of attention. So, I wanted to kind of steer that attention to a cause that I was really passionate about. A uh, close friend of mine has been involved with the Trevor Project for I think like eight years. And he told me about it probably like two months before I posted the video. I never even heard of it. So I thought that this was a great opportunity to shed some light on a great cause. They provide the top notch resources for LGBTQ kids who are in danger of suicide and they offer amazing insights into the research behind that. And they're amazing people doing awesome work. And I'm just happy that like I can continue that conversation. Yeah. And I'm always, I ask for this question because I'm always trying to tell more and more people about what they do and the incredible message that they have. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been great. Um, I just had a, a call with their um, creative director two days ago. I'm becoming friends with all of them. And yeah, if you don't know anything about them, go to their website and yeah, learn more how you can uh, help out. And, uh, young little LGBTQ kid who's trying to figure it out. Yeah. You said it was, the reaction was 10 out of 10 positive. When you went back to the locker room, how was it? And was there any negativity? Yeah, so this is a common question. I, uh, you know, football players, we often get branded as some sort of um, unintelligent, out of touch individual, but I was met with the most support um, and the most respect and I had proven myself as a football player with multiple years in the NFL before that. So it was a overall amazing experience. Thank you.
So to transition again, um, so <laughs> speak about making a difference. Um, do you want to tell everyone about your company, Raise, and what you've been doing with that? Sure. Um, so I, uh, I was volunteering in Tampa Bay about four years ago, and I volunteered at this um, juvenile delinquent center. And when I went there, it was set up by the Buccaneers. They do, all, they do everything for us. They make it super easy. And it was very... It was very, very sad because there were these kids about 12, 13 years old in jail cells. And a lot of them were there because they were just running away from a, a violent home environment. And so the experience was very, very moving. And, and the owner of the Buccaneers was there and she's done an amazing job keeping that relationship going. But was like, was most, that stuck, the, the thing that stuck out to me the most was it was a half a mile from our facility. Um, I drove by it every day for two years and I never knew it was there. It was a half a mile from a team of millionaires and a family of billionaires. So I was like, this, this, this can't keep happening. So I thought there needs to be an app where you can go on and see any nonprofit, um, depending on what you're interested in, depending on how you want to give back. So about a month later, I was like, I'm not a very creative person. So I thought about how you raise money, raise people's awareness. I thought of a name called Raise, R-A-Y-Z-E. And we're essentially becoming the LinkedIn of philanthropy. We're allowing people to go through their employer, go through their friends to find you know, amazing ways to give back. Um, I work with the most incredible people. I just had a, a breakfast with the United Way of Chester County yesterday. And the nonprofit industry is in a very antiquated state. You know, Every year, there's less and less donors in America. Millennials don't write checks, and they don't carry cash. So there's a massive need for the philanthropy industry to really innovate and modernize, and that's what we're trying to do. And it's honestly been one of the most rewarding things ever. You hear everybody's story, you hear how passionate these people are, they go to work caring about other people, and like that's the best part. And so, um, look for us, it's the best, it's really, really fun. Awesome, um, so you just finished your seventh year in the NFL. Can you talk a little bit about your Highest high, and you talk about your lowest low being um, in Cleveland, yeah. but um, being a loser. Easy answer. Um, Easy. But let's talk about your highest high. We have some Clevelanders in here, you know, so. Is there anybody from Cleveland here? I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, Cleveland's a great place. Cle I feel like I don't even need this microphone, um, but Cleveland's a great place. So that was definitely the most challenging. Um, I think maybe the most, the highest high, I, mean, I think was, yeah, I think I, I talked about it already, was uh, becoming a captain. Yeah, I think that that was like really freaking awesome to, uh, you know, walk out on the field every, every Sunday with, uh, with my guys. That was pretty, that was uh, definitely the high. Yeah. You are known for a clip from Hard Knocks, which I think a lot of people have seen, explaining compound interest to your teammates. Yeah, that was an interesting clip, yeah. <laughs> For those who haven't seen it, tell us about it a little bit, if you would. Um, I uh, was doing my best with very limited knowledge to try and teach my teammates about um, saving money, about making your money work for you, about the powers of compounding. I think people call it like the eighth wonder of the world or something like that, right? I have a degree in biology, okay? I know a lot of uh, lawyers and financial people who could probably gonna laugh at me, but a little bit of information goes a long way. And I've been advocating for financial wellness for especially football players and all athletes. I'm working with a company, Financial Finesse, to bring tools to college students, actually, so they can navigate the NIL era just a little bit better. Um, I think it will be very beneficial to move that learning curve back four years. I think that we make mistakes when I made mistakes financially coming out of college. I signed a bunch of trading cards never knew that they didn't take taxes out of a 1099. And so the next year I owed 60 grand in taxes. Like, where the hell did this come from? So like, it's very, it permeates through people who you think know about finances. And it's uh, something I'm very passionate about. Um, and I think that athletes, if they become financially, um, if they become, you know, just financially savvy, if they, you know, work hard to educate themselves and to take advantage of the many resources that they have, I think that they become, you know, role models for more than just their athletics. And I think they become role models for, you know, pursuing success that isn't super superficial, super superficial. Um, yeah, so um, I've continued that conversation. It's something I, it wasn't just like a funny clip. 
it was something I really, I, I see so many guys and they come to me in whispers and they say, hey, ass, can, I, can you help me with my credit? I said, I don't know how to fix your credit, you know? And I got coaches coming to me, asking me, uh, what's the difference between whole and, li and term life insurance? I'm like, man, you gotta read a book. So <laughs> it's a conversation that I'm having way too often and it's something that I hope changes very soon. And I think that um, I'm very lucky to have been in that video because it's really opened some cool doors for me. How was the hard knocks with cameras everywhere? It was so of. annoying, it was so annoying, yeah. Have you been, have you like, were you ever part of Hard Knocks? No, they, at the Packers they would ask us every year and before I could get the words out, they're like, no, never. Yeah, I didn't think we had a choice. I think that, that I don't know why, we were like one in 15 the year before um, and we had like 44 first round picks. So I don't know um, why they picked us, but it was definitely annoying and hearing your voice on TV, you just sound terrible. And yeah, I did not enjoy it. I remember FaceTiming you and you were eating Chipotle and they walked in. You're like, can I have a minute? Can I just have really? a minute? Yeah. She tells me stories I don't even remember. Like I like have so many stories that we have and I like never remember them. That's a good one though. That was a good one. I'm always eating Chipotle. A little plug for Chipotle. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dinner last night. And by the way, I think the most important thing about 50 students in here want to know is secrets on Grace here, so. Grace is the freaking best. Give it a round of applause for Grace Palisano. Yeah. So it was gonna be it was gonna be me, and Mr. Brand here, and then I was like, I was texting Grant, I was like, Grace, let's do it together and let's get a fire picks and like have a great time. So uh, Grace is amazing, wicked smart, wicked smart, and just uh, she thinks I'm hilarious, so that's always great. And um, yeah, so I'm really thankful that you asked me to be here. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. So. I think that closes everything for today. Thank yeah. you so much for coming, Carl. Guys, thank you for having me. Thanks, this was really Carl. nice. Thank you very much.